2021 to the February 2023 chapter meeting of the Hearing Loss Association of America, North Bay Chapter. Thank you for being here today. My name is Sarah Ozer. I'm chapter president. I'm here today with Tana Cooley, our vice president, and Alan Katsura from the HLAA California State Association. And Alan will be recording the meeting and uploading it onto YouTube. Uh, look for it at HLAA California State Association. And our captioner is Kelly DeCamp, and she's a CART captioner, Communication Access Real-Time Translation. Whether you are here from our area, Marin and Sonoma counties, north of San Francisco, or whether you join us from another place, we welcome you. For the past five years, HLAA North Bay has been accomplishing our mission of improving the world of communication for people with hearing loss through information, education, support, and advocacy. We need volunteers who want to have a more active part in our chapter. Right now, we need help with getting speakers for future meetings, planning social events, and creating publicity. Please let us know through the chat or on our website, hearinglossnorthbay.org, if you'd like to be more involved. First, some announcements. The fourth Thursday at four o'clock is our HOPE support group here in Zoom. The link is again on our website. Please join us to give support to others or to get support for yourself. Next month's chapter meeting, that's March, features Andrew Valla, audiologist here in Marin County. He'll be speaking about cognition and hearing loss. Here's some other events you might want to keep in mind. The Walk for Hearing will be the first weekend in June in Alameda at Crown State Beach. It's in the East Bay. I hope you'll come out in person if possible and walk with us and enjoy picnicking afterwards with us at this beautiful park. The Santa Rosa Senior Expo, where we will have a table, is July 8th at the Community Center on College Avenue in Santa Rosa. Our summer picnic in July in Marin County will be at Piper Park in Larkspur. Our Sonoma County picnic is Sunday, August 13th. It's at the same place that the Senior Expo is at Finley Park in Santa Rosa. So now for today's featured speaker is April Chandler. And you can see April right on the screen there. Thank you, April, for presenting to our chapter. Um, April has a wealth of information and knowledge about captions. She's here to tell us about herself and the good and the bad about captioning. She wants this um, presentation to be interactive. So please raise your hand either for real or use the reactions button at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand virtually during the presentation so that um, she can see that you have a question. Um, you can also put your questions in the chat. Uh, April will answer your questions uh, either during the presentation or right after. At the end of the Q&A, we will be putting participants into breakout rooms to try out the new Zoom automated speech recognition captions as we chat with each other. We hope you'll stay for this new part of the meeting so that we can get to know each other better and to try out the automated captions as well. We want your feedback about that. So please stay after we're in the breakout rooms to uh, provide your input. So um, April, 
we would like to um, turn the meeting over to you and thank you so much for being here today. Well, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Sarah said, my name is April Chandler. And first I'd like to thank our captioner, Kelly, who always does a fantastic job. I wanted to start off just telling you a little bit about myself. And as Sarah said, please feel free to stop me with any questions uh, if I'm not clear. Um, just raise your hand or uh, whatever it takes. Um, I'd like it to be interactive as much as possible. Um, first, I want to tell you something personal. I am a foster mom of senior dogs and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that they don't bark. Um, I have one very old girl who's 18 and we're towards the end of life. And so um, she's right by me. So hopefully you won't hear anything. Typically when I'm working, of course, uh, we are muted and blacked out. And so I, it's not an issue I have, but I wanted to let you know that. Um, that's my first heart is uh, fostering these senior dogs. Um, it's uh, very rewarding. Also just, um, I have a PowerPoint to my side just to keep me on point. Um, so you know who I am. I started, uh, oh gosh, I was certified in California as a court reporter in 1990, November, and started out working as a court reporter in Sacramento at the courthouse in 1991, January, um, long time ago. So I'm dating and aging myself for sure. Um, but at that time, we didn't have captioning. Uh, we had something that was really new at the courthouse that we called real time. And that's pretty much what is happening now. Um, just different consumers, different people utilizing the captions. Uh, and uh, they would be judges. Um, I worked for a judge and I just thought it was fascinating to put words to text. And you think, well, why would a judge need that? Well, oftentimes, at least back then when I was working at the courthouse, they would often fall asleep, mm. get distracted. And so if there's an objection, they could look down and read the transcript and rule appropriately, uh, less worry about being over reversed on appeal. Um, but again, it was also new. If any of us were around then, if you recall 1991, really most of us didn't have a lot of computers. Um, it was just um, very bulky and heavy. And so we, um, we were um, kind of growing with technology. And I will say technology is our friend. It's helped us as captioners. I'm sure you can agree, although it can be very intimidating, um, it's been our friend. And we've uh, grown with technology together to be able to provide what we do. Um, Anyway, I wanted to go back to working at the courthouse and I was there for three years and I moved back to Ohio where I'm originally from to be with my family for a few years. I had aging grandparents and um, moving as a court reporter is difficult because it's different in every state. Um, California, I'm very proud to say uh, we were, I think, cutting edge state uh, as, long, as well as Texas and uh, New York. And so we had a lot of certifications. Um, and so when I moved there, I just took a break and started teaching and was waiting to get involved in court reporting. And boy, am I glad I did. Um, in that school, the owner had asked me to travel to these colleges to talk about this thing called real time. And I said, well, sure, but why do colleges need that? Now we're going back to say 1994 now, say 93, 94. And he says, well, there's a group of people that can't hear, but they don't know sign language. And so all their life, they've been in classrooms that they've had teachers that have been accommodating and have made sure that they understand the instructions. Well, now all of a sudden they're in you know, a big university and you have these faculty members that you know, aren't as accommodating and I'm sure we all can relate to people that may turn their back right on the board with their back to the audience and then say, okay, so what's the answer? And these students were just kind of left out. 
And so um, one of the colleges that we went to, we went to many, was in Toledo and it was a law school. And I'll never forget it. The student, uh, he, he said, whatever you do, please make sure you get the joke. I thought the joke, I'm here for a law school. What do you mean the joke? Just, just get the joke, please. I said, okay, sure. So I go into this classroom. Well, law schools can be very intimidating, law classes, hundreds of students. Well, this professor started each day with a joke and it was from the students. And so this particular student who was hard of hearing, by the time he looked around to read lips, the joke was over. So he was left out. And so sure enough, I was getting the joke. And I tell you what, this student laughed. I've never heard someone laugh so hard. But for the first time, he was included in the class. He was able to participate in what every other student was able to participate in. So that was very touching to me. It was my first experience working with someone who is hard of hearing. Um, and I was very excited to learn more. Um, at that point, we went to a place, I don't know if you're familiar with this college, it's Miami University of Ohio. It's a little town, Oxford, Ohio. And it's about 60 minutes or so west of Cincinnati. And so we did the demonstration and we showed the campus, this is what you can provide for your students who are hard of hearing or deaf, who do not know sign language or would prefer to have words to text. And this person, the director of this department said, I want it, but I want her, which was me, to be here for six months to ensure it goes off without any issues. So that meant I was moving to Oxford, Ohio. It's a beautiful campus, but I wanna tell you, it's in the middle of nowhere. It, it literally is to get there, you're going through cornfields, um, sunflowers, fields, it, it's beautiful. But my point is not a lot of captioners living in Oxford, Ohio, and we needed four of us. So I had a big job. I had to uh, find people, which I gotta tell you, there was not very many, if any. So I was going to these port reporting schools and reaching out to recent graduates and saying, hey, Let's do this. It was very new. It's hard to understand life without captioning, but that was when it, where we were at that time. So we, we got together and I said, this is not gonna be easy. Um, it's gonna be very difficult, but I promise you won't regret it. And then I would meet with our students who are hard of hearing and said, okay, this won't be perfect, but I promise it will get better. And I asked, oh, we had about four or five I asked them, please tell me which are your hardest classes and I will go to one of those. And then the newer captioners will come in and take the others because I couldn't be at four places at one time. And I said, it will get better, but I need you to be patient. And they said, please, by all means. So that was where we started. It was not easy. I think every day the captioners cried. Um, it's a hard feeling when you wanna do a good job and you're not doing as good as you would like. But I said, just keep with it, please don't give up. And no one did, it was just amazing. Um, I met with students and I, I, one of the classes I wanna tell you was um, a class of swimming. And you think, well, why do you need captioning for swimming? Well, I think you all can understand where there's lecture, we need to have access, right? And so I got a lot of pushback and I have over the years um, with some faculty members not understanding um, access, equal access, accommodations, but I took my equipment and I went right next to the pool and I sat there and, and I captioned and the student was able to understand he was barely passing. Well, no wonder. Yeah, he, he didn't know what was being lectured to, you know, people don't realize that in these say swimming classes, there's also lecture. And so that was um, an interesting experience. I had another class, now we're going back to 1994, 95 now, where a professor would fly in in his helicopter. He was teaching at Harvard. 
but this was a master's business class and teach. And I would have to get his lecture, of course. That's what's part of doing a good job, getting the material ahead of time. And he simply said to me, maybe this class isn't right for that student. I said, oh, <laughs> oh no, you didn't say that. <laughs> uh, this is a state campus and uh, maybe this class isn't right for you to teach. We, you're, this student will be there and I will be providing this accommodation. Now, we weren't called captioners. I made up the term steno interpreters because there really was nothing before that. Now, that's a silly name, but that's all we had. Um, what's interesting is that professor ended up really, really praising that student. He was very smart. And this student went on to travel to Russia the following year, which of course his captioner or steno interpreter had to go with him because we didn't really have the internet back then, if you recall, those that are old enough. Um, so now we would be able to, in a country like that, maybe not Russia now, obviously, but other countries or location, just stream in. But back then, that wasn't an option. So here I was in my mid-20s traveling to Russia. Uh, I was gone for a month, specifically in Moscow and St. Petersburg for two weeks and traveled Russia, or excuse me, Europe. Um, it was an amazing experience. And um, sometimes I had to put my writer, my machine aside and write things out. It was a very complicated situation, but with a lot of prep, it went very well. I took a semester of Russian uh, language, um, culture. Um, it, was, it, it was just a great experience. And um, boy, am I glad I went. Um, at that time, I was there until almost 2000, and I moved back to Sacramento, where I grew up um, as an older child. And um, they had the same issue in a college in Sacramento, CSU Sacramento, and they asked if I could work with them. And I said, sure. Well, the more students were hearing about captioning, the more they wanted it. They had gone so long with just, you know, being um, streamlined, but now we're in a college campus and they never heard of this. They weren't used to self-advocating, but they knew they needed something because it no longer was a 15 to 20 size classroom. I'm gonna slow down. Uh, it was classrooms with 200 students. So they hired me to set up their captioning program and I did. What I found though, even though it wasn't a small little town like Ohio, I found there weren't a lot of captioners. So I had to do some recruiting. And what I did is because of my prior uh, work at the courthouse, I reached out to some very experienced court reporters that did real time for their judges. And um, while they, they did a good job, there is differences between court reporting and captioning. We come from a very similar training but obviously our consumers are very different. So there was a lot of training that went into that, but um, that's where we started at uh, Sac State. I also found that the whole CSU in California system did not have a uh, job description or a classification for captioning. And what's important about that is if you don't have a classification, then there's no real opportunity for career, careers in this field. Um, and it's very important for you, the consumer, that we have this profession. You don't want people dropping out of court reporting school and going, oh, I, I'll try captioning because I can't get through court reporting school. That's not what this profession is about. And it was important to me because I knew that if we had this classification, the whole state of California would have that in their CSUs. And what does that mean? It means they have benefits. It means they have retirement. It's a little more attractive to get qualified people for this position. Again, a very, very small pool of people we're talking about. Um, but I knew being in California, it was possible. And it was. I went many times to the chancellor's office and 
and uh, they approved it. And now we have in all the CSUs a classification for captioning. And um, I'm very proud of that because the quality is of captioners that we can hire is, is higher and better because of that. It's hard when you're competing with courthouses that pay big salaries and to pull these people aside um, before we had the training to come to our universities. It's a little different now because we've been around for so long and our court reporting schools are starting to train just for the profession of captioning. And so many, many of the students have no desire to be court reporters. They train specifically to be captioners or cart providers. And um, so it's a new day and I'm very happy for that. Um, I wanted to um, move on. Are there any questions? Um, yes, it's Sarah. Um, April, when you um, provided the captioning for, for instance, a student in the swim class or for the student in the Russian history, um, you created a transcript and then gave it to the student. So in fact, they what sat there not understanding and didn't understand it until later. Is that what was going on? Actually, we were live. So much like this, we sat next to the student and they would read the notes oh. as they're coming up. And then afterwards we would clean them up because we were new and then we would, we didn't email them back then because we didn't have email, but we would give it to them on a thumb drive. And they love that because if they miss something, as a lot of us do, they could go back and take notes. And um, that was something that was new. You know, um, we had to get permission at that time from the professors because they were a little uncomfortable. But once we educated them, they understood the value and that this was to make a level playing field for our students who are deaf or hard of hearing. So I wanted to move on. Um, the next topic is um, captioning and COVID. So in, during the COVID and lockdowns, um, there was a little bit of a silver lining. And I just say that because it opened up the world of our apps, meaning Zoom, which we're using now, WebEx, there's many, Teams, and a third party app, which is Stream Text. And I'm very fortunate because when the lockdowns happened, I was already using Zoom. And so I was able to continue with the people I was captioning for immediately. Um, there was a bit of a learning curve for, I would say, about 90% of our captioners because at, up to that point, most of everything was live or we used different applications for different captioning, um, um, like meetings that were remote. So to do what we're doing now, it, not many captioners had done that. It hadn't been requested. So that is what was unique is that we all went remote, right? And so to have, oh, I did, I'm seeing the messages come up in the chat. Yeah, we were able to um, jump in without any delay. Um, what I wanna say though, is that when you have a captioner, it's really important, I feel as a captioner to have a backup um, and I'll tell you why. Um, there's many places remotely that we've captioned. And one of them is in the courts. When we were all home working, they, I found that each courthouse had different platforms. So say in Utah, a lot of the courts use WebEx. And so when they would ask you know, me to cover something, I would say, sure, can we do a test? And you know they're very busy, and they said, "No, we're fine. We know how to do this." And sure enough, they had a hard time. They weren't able to assign me. And you have four attorneys in a courtroom, and no captions, and they can't proceed otherwise. So 
with a backup, I actually use StreamText as my backup and I would just drop a link and the consumer did not miss a beat. Um, that's important. I feel when I'm mentoring captioners, students that are becoming captioners, make sure you understand that you need a backup. If there is a problem, say in Zoom, there are professors that you know jump in and they don't assign you, they don't know how to on the first day. And there's nothing worse than a student not having access to the lecture on the first day. And so I have this link ready that I can drop into the chat and let the student know you can view the captions this way until we get the Zoom issues taken care of. Um, these are things I don't know if you've experienced, but many of my friends who are hard of hearing have experienced time and time again. And so by the second day, if they don't have their captions on the first day of class, they're starting a little behind. So um, I always say what can go wrong in technology will often go wrong. So it's best to be prepared. I wanted to move on and talk a little bit about, and I should follow the chat, I'm sorry. Okay, ASR, that's a good question. Um, actually, it's coming up next, so I'll just skip to that. You call it ASR, I call it, um, it's all the same thing, automatic um, captions. Is it a threat? We don't feel it is. Um, we find that live captioning is a superior service. Uh, many times there are speakers with accents, uh, speech impediments, and so something that a human captioner can distinguish. Um, many times I've joined a Zoom meeting and the artificial intelligence, the captions are coming up and I can read them. And it seems okay for a while until a special terminology comes up. Um, if there's echoing in the room, it doesn't transcribe very well. So um, all, you will find, if you haven't already, people will try really hard to say, oh, we got our captions already in Zoom. We don't need to hire a captioner. Well, that's not right. They don't have a choice. When you need an accommodation, they don't question interpreters. And so this is your right to have as your accommodation, accommodation, excuse me, accommodation captioning. Um, another question, good point about using live captioners who can distinguish accents. Oh, hey, Janine. <laughs> She's been, she and I have been uh, emailing each other. I just saw it was you in there. Um, there's a problem if the professor has disabled chat. How do you get your stream text link to the student? Well, typically, that is a great question, but I will have that student's email. And I always ask if possible, their phone number so I can text them individually. Um, you can never be prepared enough, um, but that's a great point. Let me see if there's any other questions. Um, I wanted to talk about the different display options. Um, I don't know if any of you have had captioning and it's a bright background um, or you have, there's different say numbers. It looks like it's a court hearing on the side of the transcript. Um, whatever that is, it's very important. As I say to hearing individuals, how would you like it if you were reading? Every day is like a book. Everything you read or you hear Others are reading lips. And so it's very important, and I know you know this, that the display doesn't have anything else but the words, unless it's streaming like we're doing today. So if you notice, the captions below are white letters on black background. That's one option. Um, often people like it like a book, black letters with a white background. Uh, yellow is a popular color, believe it or not. Um, but these are all options that are important to know that if you're going to use captioning, that you can have that changed in most settings. Now, not in Zoom, 
not in WebEx when it's streaming, but if you're doing live captioning, what I say one-on-one, -on -one, you can request that from your service provider, your captioner. You also can, the size of the font, um, that's important. Personally, I like my fonts to be big. Um, I, as I get older, my vision is deteriorating. So I like the fonts to be big and bold, but that's me. Um, others have their own preference, but just understand that, you know, if you're gonna work with a captioner one-on-one, uh, -on -one, you have those options. As I was saying about the education, there's a myriad of places that I've captioned. Um, another one I wanted to tell you was uh, for a gentleman, he had served his country in the Navy and doing so he lost his hearing because of the loud planes. And so he was going back to school to get his master's in teaching. And he didn't do so well in his student internship because they didn't provide him accommodation. So he couldn't hear the students asking questions. And so they failed him. Well, luckily at the college that he was getting his uh, master's in said, hey, you, have you asked for an accommodation? And he says, well, I don't know interpreting. You know, I don't know sign language. I, I, interpreting wouldn't help. They said, well, we have something called captioning. So I worked with him through his internship with the students at a middle school. And I don't know if any of you have been around many kids that age, but they could be a little cruel. And they were with him. Um, they kind of laughed at him. They made fun of him. And I, I sat down with him and I said, I think we need to educate these kids. And so I asked one of my former students from years ago if she would come. She was a little closer to their age, early 20s. And I talked to them. And sure enough, she took off her hearing aid and she let them look at it. She explained that this older teacher is no different than she is, that she was a cheerleader in high school and she also used captioning. And it was really interesting because this, he was a student getting his teaching credential. He did great. The students loved him after that. They understood, wow, this is what, why sometimes his voice is a little louder. You know, educating these kids was really helpful. They became very compassionate and they understood more. The problem is after he graduated and became a teacher, the school district did not want to provide him with captions. They said, no, we don't do that. So they gave him an interpreter. Well, the problem is he doesn't know sign language and he actually, sued that school district. And um, it was it was really uh, unsettling for me to know that this man lost his hearing serving his country. And then he was denied access in a teaching environment. And he did so well once he had a level playing field and had his captioning. And they let him go because they said he couldn't communicate well with the students. Um, shocking, I know. Um, I actually was deposed in that lawsuit and they just wanted to know what is captioning? How could it possibly work remotely? <laughs> and I explained to them, um, we've been doing this for quite some time now. Um, the sad thing is even in that depo, when this man testified who's hard of hearing, they used the court reporter as the captioner. I don't know if you know much about court reporting, but when they say off the record, the court reporter stops writing, but the attorneys still are talking. So here you have a lawsuit where they're not providing accommodation. And even in his deposition, he didn't get full access. Now I will say, unfortunately, we weren't able to see the outcome of that case. My dear friend ended up falling during the middle, you know, trials or excuse me, lawsuits go on for years. And he hit his head and he went into a coma and passed. Um, it was really sad. But I was very proud of him because he stood up for what was right and said, no, um, I deserve to have an accommodation. So I'm sure many of you have similar stories. Um, and it's so sad this day and age that we have to still go through things like that.
Um, other things that I've captioned, meetings like this, presentations. Um, on Saturdays, we had a cochlear implant support group. And that was one of my favorites. People came together after they had their cochlear implant and they actually were turned on and were able to share their stories with other people just like them. Um, it was beautiful. I loved it. It was something that I did uh, pro bono um, and, and always encourage our captioners to give back when they can. Um, now this is a profession and obviously this is what we do for a living, but in any profession, it's always important to never forget your consumers and to give back whenever possible. Um, other things that are captioned are theaters. I don't know if you all are aware of that. Hopefully you are. When you go to the theater, um, see a play, please let them know. If you need an accommodation for captioning, uh, Sacramento has it. Uh, we have it here in Las Vegas. It's not every show, but they have certain shows that they will have captioning. And it's not someone like myself. We all have different areas that we um, are, um, say, are experts in, if you will. I don't do theater. I don't have the proper equipment. I've been asked to. And I said, you don't understand. It's very different. And um, it's not the same experience for our consumers. Oftentimes, in these theaters, they will hand a person who is hard of hearing a notebook and said, use this. And I don't know about you, but when I go to the theater, so much of it is visual. And so if someone's looking down to read and looking back up, it's not the same experience. So again, it's very important to advocate for yourself and ask for the proper captioning, theater captioning, where it's up above, it's two lines at a time, and it's it's already been rehearsed, so everything is perfect, and it will make your experience much better. Other things are conventions and broadcasts. You know, you turn on your TV, those are captions. Um, I've actually captioned broadcasts. Uh, that's the news and um, uh, anything on TV. It was been years ago. I captioned in Canada and the United States. It's very difficult, uh, but it is an experience. Um, one of my funnier stories when they asked me to caption Saturday Night Live, and I don't know if you all remember the Alec Baldwin Christmas special with the Christmas cookies, and they threw that to me, no rehearsal, and oh my goodness, <laughs> I don't want to see what that looked like, but I've come a long way, and um, that was something that was um, a fun time in my life, but again, it's a different expertise. Uh, they would throw me the red carpet and, you know, you have to be familiar with a lot of those uh, singers and, and you have to have the songs in your, what we call dictionary. Um, and so I was doing a lot of um, what I call homework and prep to get a lot of that to in my dictionary. So it would come up during the broadcast. Um, I did a lot of news, um, but again, different setup. It's going into the news station and um, very different than what we're doing today. One other area is court. If any of you have been jurors or a witness, you have a right to ask for your captioning. Um, I've captioned for deaf judges, deaf attorneys, deaf perspective jurors. And before they were told, oh, you're deaf, you're hard of hearing, you're excused. They said, but no, 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 I, I want to sit as a juror. That's my right. And so they've had to self-advocate and say, I want a captioner. And um, of course they need time to find a capture and schedule it. But that is something I hope you all realize that is available to you. I would hope 2023, 20, all courts would provide that for you. Any questions? I hope I'm not putting you to sleep. <laughs> Let's see, we have some comments. Oh, great, Janine, my chapter co-president was denied, oh, denied accommodations as a juror in Connecticut. Yep, happens 
sadly, more often, I just can't believe it's still going on now. How can we make sure courts provide this? Well, what you do is when you get your summons, it'll be somewhere on there asking for an accommodation. And if you want captioning, make sure you put, I want captioning. And if they try to excuse you, them of all people should know that is your right. It's, it's sad, but I, I tell so many students, you have to self-advocate. Um, if you don't, people will take the easiest route and that's not the law. You have a right to have an accommodation. So I'm just moving on. Um, I wanted to talk about how we work together as captioners and consumers. So when you have a captioner, like your president, Sarah, she's wonderful. She sends us the agenda ahead of time. She'll tell us who the speaker is and she'll give us any special terminology. This is how we work together. I have a student who is studying to be a nurse and there are so many terms that I've never heard of. But as she's reading the chapters, she emails me. So by class time, I will put those words in and it makes a better experience for her. And we work together that way. Also, I've had my consumers say, hey, to the speaker, we need you to slow down or we need a break. It's been an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half. My capture needs to rest her hands. As Sarah said, she likes to see our faces to know we are actually people behind those words. I like to say we are the proverbial fly on the wall, that we are people with needs and we do a lot of work ahead of time to ensure we do a good quality job. And that is important to us, but important to you as well. Let's see here. Sarah had asked if I would talk about different programs we use, softwares. Um, it's really interesting. Most people don't realize that there's not a whole lot of different softwares companies, but they have a few and they are very expensive. Um, it's approximately anywhere from say $6,500 up to $8,000. And then if you get an enhancement for like broadcast captioning, that can be another $6,000. Um, it's, it's not cheap at all. It's a one-time investment. And again, this is a profession. And so when I do talk with students studying to be captioners, I let them know this is a profession. Make sure you treat it that way. Get the best software you can to provide a good quality service for your consumers. Also, we have little machines. I'm sure, I don't know, live captioning. It's a court reporting machine. And um, they've come a long way. They're a lot lighter and more ergonomical. But those are very expensive too, thousands. Um, I bought a new one a couple years ago, and it was... I believe almost $6,000. We also have state and national associations. So um, not all state has that, but we have a national uh, association. It's actually called National Court Reporting Association. California has their state association, which is California Court Reporting Association. And I'm very involved in that. They just voted to include captioners to as long as they're certified or have been grandfathered in to have voting privileges. And we also have a captioning committee and you all are welcome to join as consumers. We meet just to talk about how we can be better at providing an accommodation for people like yourself. And we invite everyone to join us. We have quarterly meetings. We also support our, um, what Sarah was talking about, um, the, is it Walk for Hearing? And we donate and we attend. Um, 
And there's, we have two chapters, one in the Bay Area and one in Southern California. So we're pretty active. Um, we invite you to reach out to us anytime. We want to be better at what we do to provide a better service for you. That's what's most important. Um, also, we have certifications and we have to keep up with that, with our CEUs. Um, and we also have a business license, someone like myself that has um, her own agency. Um, I have to tell you, I love what I do. Um, I enjoy court reporting, but I learn something new every day. And meeting folks like you is an honor. Um, having different areas of being able to work, whether it's education or seminars, um, I just am very grateful to have this opportunity to be a captioner. Um, I, I, I mentor these students. Uh, there were two schools I used to mentor, uh, both in California. Uh, one went out of business, which is very sad. And the other one is only remote. So we do have a shortage and that's kind of scary. So we are reaching out often to our students studying to be captioners. Um, during the pandemic, at the height of it, we had a great shortage. And because everyone was remote, people that typically wouldn't have captioning, they were asking for it. And so it, it was very stressful. Um, we were working several hours a day. Um, we captioned in your state, California, um, the um, redistricting. And your captioner, Kelly, did a lot of those hearings and I did too. And uh, very proud of that. That was long hours and a lot of work, but it was an experience of a lifetime. And I'm very grateful for that. Let me see, we have some comments in the chat. Let's see what it says here. The problem is that ADA has gaps in what it covers, weak wording, like churches are exempt from providing accessibility. If they have fewer, yeah, you're right. Let's see, fewer than 15 employees, et cetera, or just because it's religion, yeah. We do caption church services. Um, where I live, there's a group that captions pro bono for them, um, but I agree, it, there are some gaps. Do we have any questions from anyone? Hi, Michael. Hi, April. Um, oh. This is actually uh, very timely. Um, I'm way back in Pennsylvania, but uh, we're having a conference in April where we're having a captioner. It's a hearing loss conference, hopefully 100 people. Um, and it's in a nice big church. Um, and we have a captioner and we have an interpreter for those that really more rely on that if they're more deaf. But something you said earlier, is, is there like a time limit that we should be expecting the captioner to work before getting a break? I didn't think about that because we only have one captioner. Thank you, Michael, for asking that. Yes, if it's an all day event, Sometimes we team our meetings if people don't want to take a break, but I understand that's more cost. Typically, I like to go an hour and a half the most. It depends on the setting. Okay. I've gone an hour and I need a break. Someone that talks like I do, and I'm trying to not speak so fast, um, but I would really urge you maybe to take a break after an hour and a half Okay. Our hands get tired. Um, our necks, excuse me, and our brain. When I'm fatigued, I will miss words or flip them. Your brain does some really odd things when you're tired. So thank you for asking. Um, you'll probably have two interpreters because they use. do. Yes. Yes. And so you have I one just pattern. only because of what you were talking about. It just clicked that I ooh. Should we be getting another one? But I think the way we have the schedule, it's an hour to an hour 15, then a half hour break, oh. hour, then lunch. 
hour, hour 15, you know, break. So you're going to be fine. Okay. You'll be fine. And thank you for thinking of your captioner. Um, I would give that captioner the notes, agenda, names of your speakers. Um, they definitely will need that to put them in what we call a dictionary. Mm -hmm. So when the captions come up, the words translate. Are you going to have a screen up or is it one on one? Okay. Two screens, okay. one on each side of the um, of the uh, hall. Perfect. So depending on where you're sitting, you'll you'll be able to get a screen on either side of the stage. Um, hopefully not too far from the speaker. Um, we haven't gone through that logistics yet, but um, yeah. And I always remind the speakers, please be mindful of our captioners and our interpreters. It's hard when you're a fast speaker, but it's nice to have that reminder because what I tell people is if I don't hear it or don't get it, neither do my consumers. Yeah. So it's just being mindful. Fortunately, they're both, um, one's hard of hearing. She's written books on it. So she's very, and she gives speeches all the time to HLIA. And the other is a technology person, but she's a consultant to HLIA. So um, she's spoken at many of our conventions. So I think she's very um, knowledgeable. So that, hopefully that works out, but. Uh, oh, I'm sure it will. That's yeah, but I'll, I'll think about what I can get to the captioner ahead of time. I hadn't thought about that. Thank you. I would hope captioners would reach out also and say, I need an agenda. Um, I am big on that. Um, I do not just jump into work um, unless I've been doing a recurring job. But it's my responsibility as a captioner to get what I need to be successful. And to jump in a meeting, especially something like that, and not have anything, I can't do my best work. So sure. it, yeah. it's a win-win for both of us. Makes sense. Good. Thank you. You're very welcome. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, April, I wanted to say that I was on a jury and um, I found it difficult during the deliberations to understand the other people. And that was when I didn't have so much hearing loss, but I was wearing hearing aids and it had not occurred to me to ask for accommodation for that. So even though I could hear in the courtroom, uh, managing the conversation and the deliberations was uh, very difficult. And I asked to be excused later. I mean, I served on it, but then later I said, oh my gosh, I could send somebody to prison for the rest of their life or have them killed <laughs> um, because I didn't hear something proper properly at some point. So um, that's what I did. Well, Sarah, now you know. And, and please, I self-advocate. It's so easy for people to say, oh, yeah, what's your right? I've been in the jury deliberations and as a cart provider, as a court reporter, you cannot ever be in the jury deliberations. And it's a wonderful experience, to, as you know, Sarah, but unfortunately, you know, I don't know when that was, but now we know we can ask for an accommodation. And you have that right. And you will have that cart provider there by your side. And they will, you know, take down everything like Kelly is right now. Yeah. We've come too far. And again, I keep harping on, I tell my students that are deaf, hard of hearing in college, self-advocate. Everyone knows interpreting, interpreting. They're getting to know captioning, right? You hear the commercials, closed captioning provided by, but they still don't quite remember when it comes to, oh, we have a prospective jury. We have this. And so it's up to us 
to self-advocate, say, oh, I'm attending your meeting, but I need an accommodation. Um, I, I'm upset seeing advertisements on television and public service announcements from our local hospitals that aren't captioned. And I've tried to reach the hospitals to tell them that that captioning is needed. It seems it's such like uh, such an obvious lack when some commercials are captioned and others are not. So I don't know if you have experience in that. Well, what I can tell you, Sarah, is it's very frustrating. The news will use their teleprompters. And then when they ad lib, if you've seen that, they just put a little bracket, so-and-so is speaking. And it's against the law. But until they're called to task, they're taking shortcuts. And we don't wanna go backwards. We've come too far. We've come too far and we need to stand up for our rights. So when you go to a play, or you go to an experience, whatever that, whatever that is, you have the same rights as everyone else. And so that's a good point, Sarah. I'm glad you're, you know, on that and you're reaching out to them. Yeah. Oh, um, I'd like to see if there's any more questions um, from the people who are here. I think um, April has um addressed any questions in the chat um but it now would be the time if you'd like to raise your hand or um raise it using the reactions i can put my email also if there's any questions or a situation please feel free to reach out um i'm pretty involved uh, in our association and in our profession. And um, I would be happy to help however I can. So let me type that in the chat. Uh, and I see Janine has a question. Do you want to go ahead, Janine, and ask? Or I can read that, whatever Janine prefers. Yes, read it, please. You bet. I'm looking here for that question. Okay. Oh, here we go. Here we go. If this is from Janine, if push comes to shove and one of us ends up suing for lack of accommodation, where are the lawyers? that can successfully fight for us? That's a great question. I think disability lawyers, says Alan. That's right. My friend, Nick, who passed, God bless his soul. But they did that to him. <laughs> um, he fought and he was going to win. I know with a jury trial, that he was going to win. And once we have a lawsuit and it's been adjudicated, then we have case law. There's case law from UC Berkeley. There's case law from UC Davis. Once you have case law, then, then, then you can point to that. But until then, you have to reach out to, like Alan said, a disability attorney. The law's on your side, but as Janine said, there are gaps. So it's not always cut and dried, but the law's on your side. And Janine also says, you know, when we talk about disability, that's more like helping those in wheelchairs. I missed the last of them. That's right or blind, et cetera. 
that's been largely the focus of disability advocates. Well, exactly. They wouldn't say, oh, that bathroom's not small enough. Just hold it. What's the difference? So if we think of it in those terms, it's a little easier to understand. I think what happens is when someone grows up and not having an accommodation, like maybe many of us in the room, we're not used to advocating for ourselves. We've always just kind of, oh, I got it. I got enough. But if we think of it like Janine said, someone who is in a wheelchair, they have every right to be able to get into that bathroom. Well, you have every right to have access to what's being said. And so that's why we have the law. And it's not always easy. It wasn't easy for my friend, Nick. It wasn't easy for me being deposed, but I knew it was the right thing to do. And we have to show the younger generation that this is what you have a right to. When I was captioning in that classroom for that older gentleman that was getting his teaching credential, we put my captions on the side of a wall. And you would not believe there was a student who was hard of hearing. She was just sitting there not getting any information because she didn't know sign language. So she just put her in class. And, you know, I, I noticed she was reading the captions. And I went to the teacher and I said, she may be hard of hearing. She may need this in her other classes. But again, that school district didn't provide captioning. So, um, April, we want to thank you so much for sharing your, you know, career story and uh, the different aspects of captioning and um, encouraging us to advocate for ourselves and to ask for ask for accommodation. Um, and we really appreciate you being here today. And as I said, this meeting will be recorded and put on a uh, HLA a California State Association YouTube channel so you can let people know about that. Um, so thank you, um, April, and thank you, Kelly, um, wherever you are <laughs> and whatever you look like and whatever you're wearing. <laughs> thank you for captioning. That's all that matters. <laughs> um, and so we, um, we'll say goodbye to you, to both of you, and um, the rest of the group, please stay so we can, uh, we're going to go into breakout rooms. I'm going to do that now. So thank you, uh, April and Kelly. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. I hope I see you all again someday. Okay.